Well, hello, hello, and welcome to the Pioneers Show, the show where we talk with innovators, makers, entrepreneurs, basically people who are creating their own trails and creating their own lives, so that we all can learn how to work on our own lives. This is episode five, and I'm your host, Andre Dalpkerk. You can find me at It's the Andre on Twitter and Instagram, as well as the show at Pioneers Show on Instagram as well. With us today, we have Marcin, and I'm sorry, Marcin, because I never know how to say your name, Ratayak. I think it's Ratayak, but let's call him Marcin. This man is a great business mind. I had a chance to meet him while I was working at Techstars Berlin. In this conversation, we go through Marcin's experience building the real-life Harry Potter newspaper business. If you don't understand this, please go to their website that it's on the show notes and check it. It's real-life magic. We also talk about Marcin's former businesses and hustle going through different markets and industries. I could honestly go on and on, but it's better if we directly go to the conversation. Are you ready? Give it up for my friend, Martin. Welcome to the show. Martin, how are you, man? I am very fine. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you for being here and taking you for accepting. It really means a lot that you're here in the Pioneers show, sharing your experience and sharing your thoughts and your history with the all of our audience. So let's start from the beginning. Can you give us a little two-minute Two minutes briefing on yourself for now. Two minute briefing on myself. So basically, um, I started my career as a building cleaner. It was after high school, uh, where uh, I have been working in the cleaning company, who then, uh, which then basically went bankrupt. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, during uh, my studies, I was basically in between, in between my studies. So we decided together with my father that uh, we have to do something. So we tried to like uh, reorganize the company from scratch and build a company which in the end has employed over 120 employees. Oh. And had uh, a lot of uh, customers in Eastern Germany. Like so we were, let's say, uh, the high quality Polish cleaning company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, that, that's that's how I started. And um, in the end, what happened uh, was so I was studying, uh, let's say, uh, economics, so mm -hmm. making my MBA. And um, in between, what happened is the economic world crisis came up and one of our biggest customers, uh, he just didn't pay it. Like after have not paying three invoices, we realized it was, I think, 2009 on Easter Sunday. They called us and they said, okay, guys, we went bankrupt. We will not pay. Uh, uh, so, so, they so three invoices not paid, which in basically covered like nearly half of our revenue uh, at, the, at the time. Meaning basically at the age of, I think I was 20, 24, 25, I was indebted with minus 400, 500K. <laughs> this is how I went to school <laughs> these days. So it was very interesting. And as I was doing it, I mean, I, I realized that, you know, staying in a service industry will be tough thing yeah? because the economy was tough back then, everything was tough. And uh, I realized that the company is not going well. So there was a decision for me to take, okay, what will you do? Yeah, will you mm -hmm. either leave the company and uh, leave it be out there? So will you stay and try to rescue what's possible? And for me as, 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 as a Polish pe person, uh, it was, I was always raised very strongly related to mm -hmm. my family. So it was not possible at all to, <laughs> to, to leave my father. Yeah. So although I had very good grades, uh, it was 2010, I, I finished... Uh, the studies, uh, I had very good grades uh, and uh, I think I could uh, have a lot of opportunities uh, in, in the industry. I decided to not take it mm -hmm. and help to reorganize the company. And it took something like two years uh, to do so. And in between, I was thinking, what, what, what else can I do? And then actually my feeling was born that I have to do something more in the tech business to really, you know, set a foot in the door and create something that's really valuable. So making services, making something that everybody else can do. The only thing that you can do is you can either do it cheaper or you can do it with a higher quality. Mm -hmm. uh, or you revolutionize it with technology. And that was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the... That's the business of innovation. You either do it cheaper with the same quality or you do it to the same price with higher quality or you just create something new. Basically, that's it. And for me, the interest was always there to create something totally new. I wanted always to, to, to understand what it means to, to create something out of scratch that is not existing. 
Mm-hmm. I, I, as I started to, to study, I, I couldn't even understand how it is to write a thesis because in a thesis I have to invent something, right? Mm-hmm. And inventing something for me was something totally like out of my mind. Like, how can you invent something? I, mm-hmm. I cannot even think, you know, <laughs> run my own block, you know? Uh, and yeah, that was basically it. So for me, this was, it was really, you know, the difficulty mm-hmm. to have something complex, something new and create something out of nothing. This was, 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 was really catching me. And, I think that was always also the reason why, while I was studying, I was already starting to get interest into physics very deeply. Mm-hmm. So I felt really misplaced in my MBA study yeah, while everybody was going, getting drunk and drinking. I have had this phase as I was in high school, <laughs> so I could, I could skip that. And I was <laughs> you know, reading physics books. <laughs> um, okay, so you started your comp- the company with your father in mm. 2008. It was 2006. In 2000, 2008, we had this problems with the... Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. One question out of the blue. How is it to start a business with your family? Because I think from all the interviews that we had until now, we didn't have anyone that started a business with a family. Mm-hmm. And that's always something that a lot of articles are reading about starting something with your wife, with your brother. But how was the experience of starting the business with your father? It actually was super tough. And the reason why it was super tough is that my father he was working a lot while I was a kid. And I never wanted Sorry, to... Sorry, can you repeat my, that? My father was working a lot as I was a kid. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah. So I actually never wanted to do the same thing because I, I thought, uh, you know, you have to spend more time with your family and all these kind of things. But it turned out in the end that it, <laughs> I, I'm much worse than him right now. Yeah. But um, while we started it, I mean, I, I was actually opposed against it. I didn't want to start the company. I was like, why should we do this? I mean, what we have is enough. I was, I was really like down to the earth. And it was pretty tough because there's a distance in the generations. Mm-hmm. So my father was very much focused on the operations, mm-hmm. on how to get things done in a, in a proper way that everybody, you know, gives him the proper respect. And my approach was rather to, to find new ways how to do things totally different. So for me, the, the same thing as, you know, for example, selling where it was cold calling, cold the guys and uh, go from one door to the other, try to find new customers. It was awful. Uh, so, so the first thing that we, I really started to establish was back in 2008, before there was all this uh, startups with, uh, with, with helplinks and all this kind of thing. And CRMs and everything. Exactly. We established uh, the first web pages and tried to you know, acquire the customers of web pages. It was running pretty well in the end, but uh, the problem was that we never took the step that, uh, for example, all the big uh, startups, uh, cleaning startups did in the end that they hired people not as their employees, mm-hmm. but as uh, freelancers. And the reason why we did not do this is because I asked my father, I said, we cannot do this because the problem is that we will kill these people. If you work as an, as an, as an, as an freelancer mm-hmm. for the same price that a normal employee works, and uh, in the end, after one or two years, he has to pay all the taxes by himself, all the insurance by himself, and in the end, he's fucked. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, he has to restart his business and you because he not keep himself up. And this is how the startups, you know, came up in the mm-hmm. beginning. There are a lot of like Book of Tiger that changed now the way how they do it. But um, this is the way why we could not grow in the end. Yeah? So there's... Well, well, but, well, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, but the, 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 that's actually something that we, I, I think I've never think that, thought about is the cleaning business. Is it a very competitive business, at least in East Germany? It is a very competitive business everywhere. You have to imagine, I mean, I think there's two businesses on the world where everybody who has two hands can do it. It's selling cars and cleaning. Everybody can clean. Some people clean better, others clean, uh, you know, uh, worse. Mm -hmm. But in the end, if you put down the bucket with a piece of water and give him some, you know, cleaning chemicals, Mm -hmm. then he can clean. And as we started the business, we had a competitive advantage uh, over the others because my father was working as a building cleaner for over 10 years. Uh, mm-hmm. He was leading, uh, he was working the, as a technical leader uh, in some companies, which uh, gave him the status of a master's degree in, in, mm-hmm. in the cleaning. So before in Germany was like this, in order to open a cleaning business, you have to prove that you're either a master or you have 10 years of experience that you can really handle, you know, this so chemistry. It, as you said, it's the same thing. It's you either have a master or the 10 years of experience. Exactly. In, to the market itself, is it like a seal of approval? It was a seal of approval. It was regulated highly by the market. But mm-hmm. then what happened is um, the new government in Germany, they realized they have too much unemployment. 
Mm-hmm. So what they did is in the end, they cut it down. Everybody could found a cleaning company. And at the same time, they introduced the minimum wages, which meant in the end is I had to pay to my employees at least eight fifty five, I guess it was back then, per hour. Yeah? Whereas when I found my company myself in Germany, mm-hmm. I can write you an invoice, but I can pay myself far less because I don't employ myself. You know, uh, I'm a freelancer. I can mm-hmm. I can take whatever I want. If I say the business is worth this one, it's worth this one. And this is how exactly what happened with the market. They totally, you know, scrapped the market mm-hmm. from being a very clean market uh, from from a legal perspective to being the blackest market that you can imagine. Uh, uh, clean market. In, clean, in yes, quotes, right? yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be very dirty in the end. Yeah, It's very shabby, so very like, you know, unpolite people came into the market. And a lot of people started to found their own companies and they pushed the price down to the bottom. So I remember as we have uh, this one customer that we had, he got done uh, in the end, he got uh, bought by another company. Mm-hmm. And then they asked us what we want to make the services for some other years. And what we basically said in the end is, uh, of course we want to do it. But they, what they said to us, you have to cut the price down by half. And we calculated the amount of cutting by half. And we said, it's just not possible to do it in a legal way. Not for us, basically. And unless we let these people, I don't know, time travel or whatever, it was just not possible. I was calculating it up and forth for, for over 160 uh, uh, units that they in the end had. It was a lot of calculations. It was a very big deal. And in the end, we said we can not only do this if we start to fuck with other people. Mm-hmm. And for me, I was, I was, I was grown with these people. You know, I know these people from the very beginning. I could not do this. There was a morale behind that. Mm-hmm. Either you sell yourself, and this was, this would be what I would be doing. I would sell myself because I would sell my morale, or I would just not go for the money. And we just not didn't went for the money. And in the end, the market stayed as competitive as could be. Everybody came in, founded the company for one year, then they went bankrupt. The next came in. Yeah? And how's the company right now? Uh, the company is pretty uh, well, I would say. It is uh, now going out of the biggest issues. So we have restructured it. So what I've introduced inside the company, if a company grows pretty quickly, it was growing quickly, you don't watch for costs in the beginning. You know, the customer comes in, you just, you know, you just take the, you just say the yes. thing, say yes, you, operate, you make it operational. In the end, you hire people so that the operations are running. In the end, if you have a positive surplus, you're happy. But in the end, that's not it because some of the customers are negative and you don't realize it. You just realize it in a service by the numbers. And, and in the end, how, how, do you, how do you see if a customer is negative on the long term? On the long term, you can see it uh, by the amount of change that is introduced into the system. Yeah? So there, there are some in the cleaning business. You have to imagine you have uh, many dim- 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 dimensional problems. In the end, it's super easy. Yeah? But but if you really want to analyze it and have long term relationships, you have to understand how difficult it is to clean uh, a certain let's say type of office mm-hmm. and how many complaints will come in. Because if a complaint comes in, you have to jump in and you, you know remove it. And usually complaints come in not because the cleaner is bad, but because just somebody in the office spilled something and then it says, okay, it didn't happen. Yeah, so something like this happens pretty often. Also, and you have to you have to calculate this like you, you make a risk management. You understand in the beginning who's doing what. Huh? You calculate how many hours people spend, how often do they get sick. If somebody from your cleaners gets sick pretty often, you can be pretty sure that there's something wrong in this relationship between those things. Mm-hmm. And that's basically what you have to take care of if you have a cleaning company. You have to take care that your people get treated well. Because this is usually what's not happening. You're a cleaner. The people think you have not done any school. You are just stupid. You came to this country and you just, you know, try to get a grip on something. You're trying to get a job that exactly. because you have the two hands. Exactly. And the, this disrespect is pretty huge on that. I mean, I was, I was cleaning. Uh, even if You also cleaned? Yes, of course. I was cleaning uh, until the last day of, of my thesis, basically. And also after that. So I had my MBA already inside and the MBA was high grade. I was one of the best students at my school. And uh, I was cleaning in this blue collar thing. And I saw the people look, look at me and be, just because I was blue collar, you know, and this, this, is, this is really giving you a lot of information about how this world works. And I understand that my task is to secure these people who are cleaning for us because there were a lot of people like me there who had been studying in Ukraine and Poland and just came here and it was just not accepted what they did there because Mm -hmm. it was paperwork and you have to make sure that they have a good working environment. That's basically it. So after the cleaning business, what did you do? So uh, even though you apparently are still 
somewhat in touch with the business. I, I know for a fact that it's not your primary focus. No, not at all. Um, but from what I know as well, you've had some different primary focuses throughout the years. Yes, definitely. So when did you leave the day-to-day -day operations of that business? Uh, I, was, I was actually stuck with the day-to-day -day operations um, for a very, very long time. I think in, in, in where I really left out dramatically was 2014. When so we, eight years at the company. Yes, eight years at the company. I mean, I'm still inside there, but my father is more operational. I'm just trying to help him out right now because our current company is just eating me out. Yeah, But um, I was there, let me think. Um, it was 2014, basically, yes. 2014, and in, in the middle of 2014, when we moved to, to, to develop this co company to Chemnitz. Yeah, but that's another story. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, as I, as I was asking... What were the other focuses that you've been getting throughout oh. the years? So, as I said, what was really interesting me was uh, was physics. Yeah, I, I was totally fascinated, and then it started basically uh, with two things. Uh, the first thing is so I was watching a documentary on, on Einstein and the theory of relativity, and uh, I mean it really blew my mind because uh, what this theory said in the end is. Uh, that uh, depending on how much, how quick you move mm -hmm. to another uh, inertial system, your time runs differently. So, so it's not only the quick, uh, I, actually I've heard of that in different um, ideas. So the from what I've read and also thought is not only the quickness of your move, of your movement rather, but it's also the weight in Newtons that are weighed. So if you are closer to the sun, if you are able to maintain and not melt away, the strength that the sun is pulling you thanks to its gravity mm -hmm. gives you another idea of time. So that's why in theory, if you go to the mountains, the time goes slower than if you are in, for example, the Netherlands. But yeah, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. I mean, uh, it's basically the same because mm -hmm. it, it's depending on, the, on, on how mass is defined. You're exactly. You're talking about mass and mass is uh, P uh, through V, e, mm -hmm. so which means it's the impulse uh, to the speed. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the end, you have basically the same thing. And uh, yes, I mean, that's it, basically it. And if you're close to behind a big mass, so your time also runs differently. Mm -hmm. So it was really shocking me. I, I, I was pretty young and I could not understand because for me, time until then was a Linear. watch. It was a watch. It was a watch. It was something that we measured, we make measurable by, have, by creating watches. And it was not something that was really existing. And as mm -hmm. I understood that there's something existing like space, a time, I was totally down. <laughs> I, economics was nothing for me anymore, so I started to understand myself very deeply with physics. And I was even writing my theory, my thesis in physics, mm -hmm. statistical physics, trying to use models from physics to analyze the the numbers of uh, of, of stock markets. So, whoa, <laughs> that's a, a weird jump. <laughs> Why that? <laughs> that's a weird jump from going to economics, then to physics, then, I mean, it's interesting because you combine, but what kind of algorithms are you creating to analyze between physics and the stock market? So there was uh, something that my co-founder right now, whom I was in contact, he introduced me to, it was called, I think, econophysics or something like this. It, it, was, it was like, like a hype field where they were, were trying to use physical models that were applied for molecules, for electrons, like the mm -hmm. Brownian movement, in order to explain, uh, in order to explain events that occur in economy, especially in a macro economy. And I was fascinated by this thing because I realized during the studies that all the models that I have seen so far, they were just not working. You know? the people were getting, you know, Nobel prizes, but these models were still not working. Nobody could predict the the way how the how, stock market how the stock market works and. So I started to get very deep into that because it was complex. It was something I could not understand and everything I don't understand is like, it's interesting, you know? And so I was then going to my professors and I say, I would like to work on a thesis on that. I think that is an interesting field. And all the professors said, no, <laughs> it was not possible at all to, to get anything in front out of that because the problem was that the professors in economy or let's say in business, for them, it was way too theoretical. Mm -hmm. And the professors uh, from physics, for them, was way too, too too easy. Let's say something like this. I just said, really, oh, this is something that is not really interesting. It may has nothing to do with science. I mean, the problem is that until now, business is not treated as a science. 
And this is something that I have to like protest against it. I think it's the most difficult science that we have out there right now, yeah, because nobody understands it. Yeah? And as long as nobody understands it, it means that we have schemes behind it, which mm -hmm. are still not understood, you know, fully by, by the way how we work. And it's so dynamic that the system that we have to analyze, it changes all the time. And for me, it was fascinating. And I remember that occurred later, I was sitting with a professor from economy and I tried to <laughs> explain the model for two hours. And after two hours, I thought we are already deep in the model. I realized he didn't even understood the basic implications of the model. So the first five minutes, he, he went out there, oh. but he could not just really tell it. So it was very complicated in the end. And maybe also my pitch was very bad and ended at this time. This could also be happening, you know, because I was pretty young at the field and yeah, but it was fascinating me. And in the end, I found a very young professor who said to me, yeah, I'm junior prof right now and I need somebody who writes a thesis. And I think I was the first guy who wrote the thesis at his institute. And he said, yeah, let's do it. It's interesting. So I did the thesis. And I did it pretty well. I was even able to predict uh, some kind of fluctuation on the stock market. Mm -hmm. I was even thinking to make a business out of that. But back then, I was so deep inside uh, of, 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 the of the materials that I thought about uh, writing my PhD. Oh, That's interesting. Yeah. And why didn't you go through it? I was applying and writing to over 30 professors over whole Europe. And nobody wanted to take me. Mm. This topic exactly because of the problem I was just saying because for the it's business. either too easy or too theoretical. Exactly. So you couldn't go to economics teachers because it wasn't practical enough, and you couldn't go to physics teachers because you, they didn't believe in the essence or the the, the hard part of that on that science. study. Exactly, and and but but, but that, that's stupid, isn't it? It is. And I mean, I realized why I was sitting with the one professor uh, here in Berlin. And I realized when I changed my pitch, I could get this thing. Hmm. The only thing I just had to tell him is with this, with this project, you could sell the algorithm in the end to mm -hmm. Deutsche Bank and they would be able to, you know, you know, save some costs. If I would pitch it like this, it would be no problem at all. But I did not do this. Because I was so interested in the science of it. I, I, I didn't even think for a moment of the money. And the reason why I was in, in this thing, why I was so emotional, it was that um, because my company went so bad because of these fluctuations. The, the, the cleaning the, company. The cleaning company. Yeah, in the end. So because of this price and the fluctuations, and I realized that, uh, you know, total free trade, uh, trading totally freely, things that really mm. have an impact on how we work and how we do Although it's just a trade, it's, it's made be something that it's just way too speculative and we have to maybe, you know, get some grip around that. But was the, the, the algorithm or the theory behind the, the econophysics, mm -hmm. so was the theory that you could explain the fluctuations of the market or were you able to anticipate the fluctuations in theory? In theory. You could, you could in theory, you could anticipate it and it, would, it, it actually worked to anticipate it because uh, the model that I picked out was the minority game model. It's an amazing model. It's, it's, it's really amazing. So many papers were written uh, based on that. But uh, I think my work was the first work who really tried to understand whether you can find some parts of the model in the real stock market. Uh, nobody did this before. <laughs> is, is it published? Uh, I think it is published, but I never published it in the, in, in, in the paper or something <clears throat> like this. Uh, but I think it's accessible. So just to give you an idea of the problem, because it's really amazing. There's a bar in Santa Fe. That's uh, based on, mm -hmm. on, on, on this thing. Uh, there's a bar in Santa Fe. And once a week, I can't remember which day it was, uh, they are playing music there. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the bar and the bar is crowded then the acoustics is so bad and the event is so bad that it doesn't make sense to go there. So the best thing is to go there when the bar is half empty. So there are 100 places in the end. Mm -hmm. And if you go, if, if there's just below 50 people, then it's an amazing evening for you. It's worth every money. So what in the end the people tried to do is it was a time when big data was just approaching. Mm -hmm. They were thinking about how can I know whether the next Tuesday more than 50 people go or less than 50 people go. And the way to be more than 50 people or less than 50, 50 people is the same way how you think about, you know, trading stocks. If you're a speculative trader, if mm -hmm. you don't go in, inside if information. It's above this level, exactly. should buy now. Is it because positive then I or could... negative? Exactly. That's kind of a binary trading thing. Yes, it's a binary trading thing. But the thing is that these people who are thinking about how to get this thing done is they have made strategies out of the 
last numbers of uh, attendees at this, let's say, uh, event, yeah, this mm -hmm. music event, this Barnes Center Face. So they had like a list from the magazine where they say, okay, 50 people went there, 55 people went at this day. So what will happen now? Yeah, They try to anticipate out of the historical data up front. And this is what basically all models do right now. So the basic idea was to take all existing models, financial models, put them then together inside of a big, you know, software and then make it them together work like the anticipation of, of, of the market today, just mimic the anticipation of the whole market mm -hmm. and then try to get, identify how the, how, the, how, the, how the fluctuations will be. And I have, I have faked this thing. It was working pretty well. So I had 2% better than the market. Interesting. But what made you stop? Um, what made me in the Because end... Because if you're above the market, mm -hmm. at least even if 2%, 2% is a lot. Yes, it's a lot. What made you stop? What made me in the end stop is that nobody gave me this 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 PhD. And in the meantime, I was running out of money because, uh, as I said, the old company was not running mm -hmm. pretty well. We just lost this big contract because uh, they, as I said, they... they, they the the, the stock market. So the thing that eventually got you passionate about the problem was... I also the problem for you yes as it was a problem for me and also a problem for the world because i realized all around me the people were in a, like you know in a very bad mood <laughs> and i just didn't want to do this and I I, just... I, honestly i don't have a lot of memories of the crash because i think i was like in eighth grade so it made little to no mm. impact on me because i don't remember even my parents talking to me about that so mm. it's actually interesting to, to hear someone who got so passionate about the problem because the problem was hitting himself but you also actually try to work on the the problem that's very very interesting so so let, let's say so you were you didn't go forward to the to the project because you didn't get the phd and you got your company wasn't the cleaning company wasn't going that well so exactly. what did you do so because I, I wanted to do my PhD for mm -hmm. me it was sure to get the PhD because the topic was so difficult mm -hmm. I have to build another company so that uh, the professors I go to the professor and say I have my own money you don't have to fund me yeah because this is a big problem usually they have to pay you you just have to sign that I can write my PhD and in the end you can just review the PhD and give me some hints yeah? mm -hmm. but I will pay myself you don't have to worry about anything so I founded the boating company. Um, a boating company. A boating company. What in the end, what does it mean? I have, uh, it, was, it happened by chance. There was a guy who was uh, working for the cleaning company. And no, uh, I think it, it, was, it was a woman. And yes, and her husband was uh, creating boats, like rowing boats for fishing and all these kind of things. Mm, huh? okay. And they were asking me whether we can help them selling these things. And selling the boats, yes, selling the boats. Okay. Yeah, because they they saw that there were many uh, like players in the market, and and uh, they needed help to, to to make this thing grow. And I said, okay, sounds interesting. So I I went there. It was just two two months after I finished my uh, thesis, and I, I went there. I take a look how you produce the boats, and I say, you know, I think we can do something out of that because they were really high quality, yeah, which was. Sell them back then uh, for Polish products. The high quality aspect was growing there. And I said, I think we can make a market out of that. So I started to sell the boats over the internet. Mm -hmm. it was, back then it was over eBay. I, we made a web page and sold it over eBay. It was uh, running pretty well, actually. But uh, in, in the end, we had uh, a deal together, uh, an oral deal that uh, uh, it only makes sense if we don't dilute the product too quickly. Mm -hmm. If he starts to sell the boats to everybody else, what will happen in the end is we'll have competition against each other. So he will, in the end, in, in, increase his sales, but... Uh, Not your own sales. Exactly. The resellers, they will have to get with the price down, with the margin down, it will make no sense in the end. Yeah? For him, it will make sense, but... Yes, but for us not. And in the end, uh, he was not p uh, patient enough to, to wait until we get to the sales. So the first year was good. The second year was good. But I realized all of a sudden that uh, the product was offered by many other parties. And you were doing this while running yes. the cleaning company? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, how did you manage the time? Because I, I, I assume that selling boats, it's, it's a very hands-on operation. You cannot do it by mail. Um, yes, you can do it by mail. It's amazing. It's, 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 really? I, yes, this is, this is what I was searching for. I was searching I was, because my, my, my intention was to find me a business model 
like like these tea shops where you have something that sells over the internet where you don't have to explain that much. You just ship it directly so that I can focus on my PhD. And I thought with, when I make a business like this, maybe I can make three to five K a month and then I'm totally satisfied. I don't have to earn more with that. Yeah, I will earn my, I will sell my boats and I can focus on making my PhD. This was the basic idea behind that. Yeah. All and, this while yeah. working day to day on cleaning. Yes, and I was working on the cleaning business and uh, trying to get the PhD done <laughs> and you know handle the family and all this kind of thing. Oh. <laughs> What kind of frameworks did you use in terms of time management? Because I assume this is not a very easy way of managing your own time. Hmm. I, I actually, I, I don't use a framework at all. I'm, I really just try to get things done. And the moment they, they pop in, I try to get them done as, as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. So this helps me to, to, to really solve things very quickly and get them off the table in the moment when they arrive. This is a down phase uh, in the times of email right now. It's e email mayhem, I call this. Yeah, I get like 80 to 100 emails every day. So if you try to do everything at once. You will not be able to do anything at all. Exactly. Yeah, so, so these times are a little bit tougher right now. But in the end, I try to identify the things that I can do right now. Mm -hmm. And if there are things that I can't do right now, I try to ask myself why. And what needs to be done and what needs to be taken and to, to be done later. And if I can't do things at all because I realize the time frame is just not possible, I just drop them. I very quickly drop things that are not working out. Like with this company, I mean, I was doing it for nearly one year. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of the second year, I realized I have to drop it because it doesn't grow in, in the same way that, that we do it. And although it was running profitable, It was just not growing quick enough. And I, I understood I have to put way too much effort inside that. For it to grow to be enough for your effort. Exactly. To, Interesting. To, to reach what I mean. I, I mean, I mean, I'm lazy by nature. No? <laughs> the human the human body is yes. lazy by nature. So you, you close the company? Yes. I mean, there's a big curiosity in you. I mean, curiosity. I think you can hear from this, this interview that you got a lot of energy. And so... I know that you didn't stop here. So why come up with, or which company did you come up next to? Um, so the next thing what I thought about, it's now go going to get totally crazy. So I was so angry about this thing that I basically said this for myself. I, I was so angry that it didn't work out because I was also like disappointed in, uh, in, in humans again, huh? mm -hmm. that uh, they could not keep the words. And I just had this oral contract. I was angry at myself. That was so stupid to not write us down. Huh? Mm -hmm. So I, I had still had this physics thing in my head, yeah, and I said to myself, okay, so let's work on a cleaning company, let's maintain this thing, and, and uh, in the end, in the meantime, let's go and study physics in the evening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I went to study physics and, uh, at the Freie Universität in Berlin. And it was working pretty well for me, actually. So I was working and uh, making physics in between. And uh, what basically happened in the meantime is, um, again, uh, one of my employees came to us and says, my wife is working in, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And what they basically do is, uh, this is like, you know, uh, I say a human rental service. It's, 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 <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's this work where they, they, they rent you for somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for temporary gigs? Yes, uh, for, for temporary things. Uh, human uh, rental service. It's, 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 it's a human rental service in the end. Yeah, that, that's what it is. And then, but just the thing that they did in the end is they cared more. So they 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 they, they came up with Dutch guy uh, mm -hmm. who who I was really like impressed by this guy basically back then because he he was pretty young and he had found a company that had I think more than five thousand employees back then or something like that. So it was really amazing. Mm -hmm. and he came to me and said, "I have a problem. I cannot get." humans to work for us or, or work for us in the Netherlands. Can you get me those people there? And, you know, I was so well connected in Poland uh, all around the villages. I said, of course, let's, let's do this. Yeah. And I had no idea how to do it. Of course I said, I can't do it. Yeah. And I started to think how I can do it afterwards. But my feeling, my gut feeling was telling me that I can do it. And we did together a deal. You know, the first deal was working pretty well. And what I realized is that, uh, 
the staffing and searching good people to work with you is something that we could already do very good in the, in the cleaning business. Mm-hmm. Because our capital were the people that were working at, you know, at the retail stores, at the offices. You had to trust them. You had to make sure they understand what they do. They had to be good people. And of course, you had to take care well for them. Yeah? And in the end, this is what we do. So... I, don't, I can't remember like the, the, the contracts, but we organized people from Poland and drove them over to the Netherlands. And that's how I found the recruiting company. And uh, this was working pretty well. <laughs> so we had a very big deal in, in Berlin where we've been, uh, you know, restorating an, an old, big, like very high building. And this was working super good. And uh, we have had the goal to hire people only from Berlin, yeah, from Germany. No Polish people, or at least not that many Polish people, to also be politically correct. Mm-hmm. And we we made it. Yeah, So we really went into the villages outside Berlin and found really good and skilled people who were working their ass off. They could go on to the Netherlands and work for that. They were working here in Berlin. We also had and later deals in Berlin here. Yeah? Oh, interesting. We found people here where other people were not able to find them. And the reason why we have find these people is because we have offered them some vision. We have offered them, you know, a little bit better salary than, than the rest of the thing. And I think uh, what what we try to do every time in recruiting, we have tried to give them respect. And do, um, do you think that the, um, the learnings that you had during the, the PhD thesis story, the, the the pitching idea that got you a better a, a better view on how to get these people because I assume that if you're leaving your country and going to the Netherlands or if you're leaving your mm-hmm. village around Berlin and moving to Berlin you need to have some kind of sales pitch mm-hmm. do you think that the, the the times that you had to uh, that you learned to pitch differently specific theses and theories that it it's connected somehow to the idea that you could sell a vision and ideas to other people's and businesses Yes, I think I realized uh, pretty quickly that uh, it actually takes two things. First of all, you have to show the people why they should do it. And so other recruiting companies, they just brought, we have a job here, apply. Mm-hmm. Yeah? And if they applied, they, they tried, they, take, they, 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 tickle, they took a look basically, uh, what did they have the competencies, the mm-hmm. experiences, if they had them, they said, okay, come to us. Yeah. And for us, so for me, it was always like, I was pitching them what they do. I said, the job that they do is amazing. And I was trying to hear to their problems, to understand what do they really need. So to adapt either the pitch to them or to tell them directly this will not work out. But was this, this? Uh, I mean, it's kind of obvious that you should do this. I mean, you have like Simon Sinek, TED Talk, all, on, all of this. But was it obvious from the get-go for you that if you change the perspective of me to you rather than you to me, was it an easier sell? Give me one second, sorry. You can... I mean, let me think for a second. If, you, if, I, if I change the perspective from me to you to you to me, what do you mean exactly? I mean, if you start with why, you're saying why you should mm-hmm. care about this and not yeah. necessarily why I care. Yeah. So did you learn about that switch? Because a lot of people, when they're trying to sell, it's me, 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 I want to do this to you rather than why you should care and why you should listen to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I, I think I didn't learn this at all. I think I had this like intuitively. Yeah, I'm, I'm, let's say, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really like fragile and I really can feel emotions out of people. Mm-hmm. And it was always interesting me. I was always trying to think, uh, understand how people feel and how they think inside of the people. So it just came out of the way how I am. I actually never thought about this, that this is the way how to sell it. I remember this, I was reading all this selling thing as I was, you know, trying to cold call for, 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 the, for the cleaning thing. And, and there were all of these things written down and, you know, <laughs> how, how do you basically sell, use positive words, short sentence, all this kind of things. And, you know, I, I tried to readapt it and over and over and over and over again. But in the end, I, I think from my mindset, I was never there. Mm-hmm. Where I was always there was uh, when I was speaking with somebody, trying to understand what he was saying to me. Yeah? So this is, and I tried to understand what the people, when we, when we were recruiting them, what they were saying to me, what they really want. What, uh, whether we can also deliver what they want. Yeah? And I was trying to under- tell them the same thing, what we are offering to them. Yeah? <coughs> so that's basically the thing. And I think the pitching, the, the really the pitching, it was something that I did in the beginning very intuitively. I don't think that I really did it on purpose. I think they're entrepreneurs that are really like much better than me do that know they have to do it like this. They mm-hmm. really utilize it. But in the beginning... So you're intuitively in the, the... So the the empathy that you were able to build 
also by building the company with your father and working side by side and doing the business and cleaning at the same time that you are running the company. I think, did you think that that built yes. a bigger sense of empathy that you can now translate into bigger? Interesting. I mean, and, and one, one another question, then you can answer either one of them. So, and just to be clear, you were doing this, all of this while still cleaning? Yes. I mean, not, not not the whole day, you know, but of course. But, but still, do, you know, doing some work and all this kind of thing. It's all possible if you manage it very well. And I'm and I'm a risk taker. I love to take risks. And for example, as I was writing my thesis, mm -hmm. uh, we had it was uh, the winter from 2009 to 2010 was the worst winter in history of my life in in Berlin. I've seen it was snowing for I think two or three months every day. The whole day and we had uh, as, as a service what we had basically was uh, you know getting rid of the snow winter deeds called in germany yeah? so what happened all the machines broke down all the people get sick because nobody could withstand you know to go out in the morning go out in the evening take out the snow it was snowing all the time so i was out in the snow for like eight hours from five o'clock in the morning waking up at minus 34 degrees yeah, i was super cold <sighs> And, you know, getting rid of the snow for, like I say, let's see, at least, you know, five different spots because all the people were getting sick. And then I went home, you know, read a little bit papers. Then uh, I went again back to, 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 you know, get the snow out in the evening because you have to make sure that mm -hmm. when it stops snowing, you have to get rid of the snow. Uh, otherwise, you're liable. And so I was writing the thesis basically. I was thinking about this while I was driving with the car. <laughs> so you're building the thesis in between breaks yes and at the same time creating your own business on the recruiting side yeah this, 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 no this was later the recruiting business was in 2012 basically yeah? so but the thesis was in 2008 and 9 to 2010 and I just came up with the example to give you a feeling mm -hmm. how I was working so I, I, I knew that I have to do this work mm -hmm. and I knew that I don't have that much time so what I tend to do is I try to think a little bit more what I will do and in the end execute I think I started executing the thesis maybe four weeks before giving it away. So I was just reading and thinking through the whole problem again and again while I was sitting in the car <laughs> and while I was cleaning yeah, and taking the machine. Hmm. Going back to the, the, the recruiting business, is it still on? Is it still uh, no, on? no, uh, I, I, I canceled this thing because... Uh, For the same reason as you canceled the boating thing? No, or? because uh, then we came up with uh, Ainuru. Ah, okay. And uh, I was so fascinated by the thing that I just said in the end, okay, uh, I could still do it, but I, it was just not possible to do both at once. Mm -hmm. So while I was um, doing uh, Ainuru, there were still some businesses uh, ongoing. Uh, so I had still some customers. And I think they still paid me until the middle of 2015. But in the end, I just did not follow it up anymore because I have found nobody who tried to like uh, take over the business. Mm -hmm. And back then, I also really didn't uh, took the effort because I also see that the market was changing. I realized that um, also in Poland was more difficult to get the people out to, to Germany because uh, the economy is running pretty well in Poland. Yeah? So they tried to, they had struggles to getting Ukrainian people to Poland to work there. And so the distance was getting, uh, you know, far, you know, much, mm -hmm. much, much bigger uh, to travel for these people. And it's required for me to, you know, to get into the Ukraine mentality. So this is difficult. You need people to understand this. And, uh, or even go far beyond that and go to India, to Pakistan to get these people from there. Uh, and this was something that I realized pretty early. And I said, okay, it was good for the time that we was doing it. But right now, the focus was just on Ainuru. Yeah? So let's take that as a segue. Can you explain to the folks at home mm -hmm. or at the gym or in their daily commute, what's Ainuru? I mean, imagine that uh, you sit in your, at your magazine and you have your you know, favorite magazine on a Sunday morning uh, while mm -hmm. breakfast and the pictures on the piece of paper start to move. So like Harry Potter's newspaper. Like Harry Potter. So basically, we utilize this technology that you can bring inside of a paper to get it outside of packaging. But you have packaging that first of all can light up. So mm. you have uh, a bottle of, of, of drink that is more visible in a point of sale. And uh, it draws your attention. And uh, why is it important? Because attention is something that creates sales. Mm -hmm. Something that you don't see in a point of sale, you don't buy. 
just simple like that, scientifically proven. And in the end, the technology that we are utilizing to get this thing done, to get the effect done, is uh, printing ink technology, which allows to be applied on the packaging with a standard printer that is utilized in today's printing houses. But does it have to be on a business side? Does it have to be on a printing house? And can you, can't you have like an HP or a brother printer at home and print that? Or is it more on the business side? You can actually do this, to be totally honest with you. But <sighs> uh, to, but uh, we will not do, uh, approach this way right now. What we really want to do is to sell it to, to the big customers, uh, to the big printing houses, to the big packaging manufacturers, so that they can apply it over there. You know? I mean, I understand this for people at home that are not that have never seen this. I'll try to hook up some videos on on Instagram and link up to the, the website. I know it's I N U R U dot D E, right? Right. So everybody sees it. Uh it's it's magic. I mean I I know marching for some time now and I've seen it and it's magic. I thank you. I, I, I don't know other other way of putting it. And the Harry Potter analogy even makes more sense with the magic thing. I mean, the 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 the, the card, the business card that lights up when you touch it. Ah, oh, that that for me, it's magic. Makes n- so. How did you? Okay, let's take a step back. How did someone with economics and physics background, with a cleaning business background, with three other businesses that no, not a very big correlation between them, get mm-hmm. to printing ink paper, printing ink technology rather? So. Actually, it's a little bit related with all the things. So what I realized when I was doing all that kind of things is that, that service industry and, you know, just selling things, it's not the future. It will not make me happy. And so I was very into this physics things. And I wanted to do something with technology. Uh, I, was, I was dreaming always to do something with, I don't know, try time traveling machine, whatever. So, so all these kind of things that people dream of, this is something that I truly believe is possible. So, uh, and my co-founder, Patrick, actually, he was on the other side of the fence. Yeah, He was a physicist. He was mm-hmm. working in physics and he was so fed up of sitting in the labs. And, <laughs> you know, this romantic view that I had of physics yeah, with Einstein and all these kind of things his heart shaped glasses were totally smashed. Yeah? So he called me and says, Martin, uh, it was, I think it was 2011. It was in the summer. Uh, I have an idea. He said, we have bought a measuring tool yeah, for the university, which cost 50 K and I've opened it up and I could rebuild 500 euros. I said, what really? He said, yes. So let's take a look on that. And I, and, and I took a look on that and in the beginning was looking amazing. And I said, okay, I know how to found it. I mean, I know how to get money from, uh, from, from the government to, mm-hmm. you know, start this business and all those kind of things. But the main business was from the get go printing. No, no, it, it was really to, from his idea was to, to create a measuring device hmm. and to rebuild the measuring device that they buy, buy for 50 K. But instead just for a much lower price. Exactly. For a much lower price. It was, it was his idea. And to make the long story short, I did an analysis, a business analysis, looked how many customers would be out there on the market and just realized we would maybe sell 200 of these devices and then the market is saturated. And the competition was so super tough. There were like really huge and big companies out there. They would just smash us. If they would see that we offer this like for the half of the price, they would do the same. <laughs> or mm. they would do it even better and with a higher quality. And even if you would apply a service like, you know, model to this, no, not at all. But um, I told this to Patrick. I said, Patrick, I really don't believe in that. Yeah? And we already had back then a team who also wanted to work with, with us on that thing. And I said, I really don't believe in that. But there was one thing that was really keeping me satisfied. And I asked him, so the organic stuff that you are measuring there, yeah, that we measure there, uh, what else could we do with that thing? Yeah? What, what, what kind of material is this specifically? It was interesting for me. He said he measures organical films, yeah? whatever this is for a guy who comes out of business. <laughs> I said, good. And we met, I remember in Neukölln, it is all flat. And he says, yeah, you can make all LED with that. And I remember from the advertisement from the MediaMark uh, leaflet said there was OLED in some Samsung smartphones. It's their, it's their own technology, I think. I mean, I think the iPhone got late because of the lack of OLED mm-hmm. screens from Samsung. Yes, I mean, uh, Samsung and there are two key players right now in the market. It's Samsung and it's LG that have developed this technology. And yeah, and, they, and actually they are selling it now to everybody. So... That was the start, and I said, "Hey, OLED, it's it's, it's amazing, yeah." And and uh, 
I was then Googling it and of course Wikipedia and I realized that the science was so far ahead right now that they said in the end, what you could do with this, you could do flexible light. And I was like, Patrick, you can do flexible light. Oh, that's amazing. And he was like, oh no, wow, I'm working on this so many years. Nobody can do it. so many problems. Uh, it's not possible. Yeah, it's a typical scientist approach. Mm-hmm. Right? Because there were like 10,000 papers, like literally 10,000 papers written on that, why it will not work. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Or what are the challenges that have to be taken, all these kind of things. And back then in 2012, a flexible OLED was not possible because the OLED it doesn't like moisture, it doesn't like oxygen, it doesn't like anything. So if you put it on a PET, it's actually eating all the moisture and the oxygen and killing it. Mm-hmm. So it was not possible at all. Yeah? And for me, it was like, I was fascinated. And I was fascinated because of two things. The first thing is I saw a technology that for me looked like, you know, like from the future. I can It's yeah, magic. It's magic, you see, exactly. Yeah, it was like, it's not even future, this is from a, a, a different realm. Yeah, so, something like that. And I was, I was like, I was just flashed. I was really totally flashed. I was just talking all the day, like with the Einstein thing, all the day about this technology. Patrick, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he could not hear this. I, I believe that. Yeah, <laughs> Because he had so many scientific things that I never understood what he was saying about it, how, how my why it may go wrong, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think it was necessary that I don't understand them because maybe if I would understand them, we would never go to this way. So this was the first thing. And the second thing is that I was a kid. I remember myself, I was I was playing with uh, catalogs. Do you remember this big catalogs where you can order something? Like the yes, Amazon catalogs, paper. Yeah. <laughs> the Amazon and paper, they were like really heavy and big. And for me as a kid, it was like the best thing that we could do uh, as we were playing. So we took this catalogs, we opened the last page because they were the electronic gadgets. Mm-hmm. And as a kid, we always said, you can pick one thing from this site that you could buy if you were the millionaire. Yeah? So we were speaking <laughs> out the things, you know, until we get to the like women's trousers that weren't interesting anymore. Yeah? <laughs> All the things that we've talked and all this thing that was interesting as we were picking them out and I remember as a kid I was playing with this catalog in my room and I was sitting there and I was saying to myself if I could make this catalog like a TV that I have all the content on top of it and make it as thin as, as, as a piece of foil this would be much easier to, to, to carry uh, I, I, it would be just amazing mm-hmm. and I had this vision as a kid and I was, I was really like into it and I as I was a kid, as I had a fantasy, I was totally lost in it. I could lose myself for hours and just thinking, reminiscing about this thing. And I didn't care about the world around this. And I was carrying this fence w- with me and I saw the OLED. I remember I was writing to our team this email yeah, uh, after having two or three beers. And I said, yeah, all right, just this about this vision. Yeah, because I was talking about the vision. Let's do this. Yeah, Let's do the OLED. Let's do the screen. Let's do uh, all this kind of things together. And um, we'll make it. And I wrote this email. And it was like silence behind that. And one of the people they asked answered like, oh, let's maybe go to the Sabbath or let's go for a beer and discuss this. And this was like a typical no. I said, <laughs> I said like, okay, I was drunk. I, I opened myself up to you guys. Let's so we can do what we should do. And But I realized that uh, maybe the vision was always too far ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but I was still pushing it and, and thinking how we can get there to this vision. How can we find an application? And so we try to like reminisce all the applications that we can do that are maybe easier to do that. You know? And I remember me and Patrick, we've been sitting in a sushi store. And uh, now actually starts the actual story behind the noodle. Yeah? So this was like the... the, mm-hmm. the this the, was the intro. This was the intro, the, the, like the introduction of the game. And uh, we were sitting at the sushi store, the Friedrichstrasse. And uh, while uh, looking at the menu and picking something to eat, I realized there was this this, this, this koi drawing, this, this, this Japanese, Chinese mm-hmm. koi drawing. And I thought to myself, it would be nice if this fish would swim over the paper. It would be nice to the eye, but it makes no sense at all. And in the moment I said, Patrick, you know, if we could do this on advertisement, imagine the impact that it would have on the advertisement industry. Because if something moves... It catches the eye. If something is still, it's like, you know... It's, it's just another thing. If something moves, it ca- it's getting your attention. Exactly. Yeah. It's demanding your yeah. attention, rather. And I remember me and Patrick were sitting there. And he was... He had like, you know... His spine was, you know, with goosebumps. My spine was with goosebumps. It was just flushing out of our spines. 
and it was basically amazing. Yeah? So we went out there and we saw moving pictures everywhere. I, I remember myself, we went on the street and I saw everywhere lights flashing out. So the fans were so strong yeah? <laughs> that I could imagine there were posters hanging on the walls where there was uh, the, let's say, the, the cover of the Nirvana, mm -hmm. Nevermind album, where the baby is floating the baby. through the water. Uh, after the money bill, yeah. So we can see all that kind of thing. It was we were flashed. So, but this is a much more advanced technology than that one that in the US it's very common of the lights going up and down. This is on paper. Exactly. So w was it on paper already thought of? Is it only on? Or? What we thought basically is that we will print the display technology because we knew that the OLED potentially is printable based on the materials it was used. Mm -hmm. So we we knew that if we could print it directly on the paper, like normal ink, you can have the display directly on the paper. So you can directly show videos and animation on the paper. This is what we were all about. And we saw the prototypes on a thin piece of film. They were super expensive back then and they were working. Mm -hmm. So if they could do it very thin, like, you know, one-tenth uh, of, let, or let's say, on, on the thickness of a hair. Yeah, so we could do it. So we thought, why should we not be able to print it? And uh, we went out to the sushi store, totally flashed, and went out to the market and asked all the people, do you want it? And uh, 17 said no. One said yes, if the price goes down. And we started to work on getting the price down. So this is how it all started in the end. Yeah. So in, uh, nowadays, is there anything already moving or is it still a longer term vision? Mm -hmm. So what we do today is right now, we have developed the, the core technology that is necessary to make it moving. It's the light effect itself. So if you have a display, for example, in your, in your smartphone, it's consisting, if I may simplify it right now, and the more technical users, they will now bash me, but I just want to simplify it to make it understandable. Mm -hmm. You have two things out of which it consists. There's the one thing that creates the light, and there's a transistor behind it who says you, uh, you create light or you don't create light. Yeah? Okay. So... What was already existing be, be back then was the flexible transistors. So you either are one or zero. Exactly. Yeah, so you either the midlight, you don't the midlight. So the transistors were already existing. Mm -hmm. What was not existing back then was the way how to make the light itself flexible. Yeah? And we realized that if we go with our technology for a market niche, which is like packaging, mm -hmm. where the product or advertisement, where the product just have to live some seconds until it gets bought, we have the opportunity to, to fight against the big guys and then like Samsung and LG because they are focusing you know on this high quality approach mm -hmm. with uh, this high prices and we said we want to make something that's living a very short time and but it's low cost and has another uh, totally different purpose than what is used from, for what it's used today and it's not direct competition to the exactly. OLED panels exactly. on smartphones so let's put it this way if imagine that I'm looking at a magazine nowadays, the current application is on light. The current application what we do today is basically we this is what we have done right now is light. So we can make uh, we can light something up. We can light something up in a sequence, meaning that uh, you can show a small animation something like that. Yeah. And the next thing that we will now do, and we hope to be ready within the course of the next year, is we'll show small videos directly on the packaging on the paper. Yeah. Okay, one question about that, because that seems like, once again, this is magic. Does this thing, is this video slash animation powered via Wi-Fi? Does it have internal storage? I know this is very weird to ask on a piece of paper, but how is this powered, mm -hmm. this kind of content? I mean, what we do basically today is we can print the power source. So printing a battery is something that is possible without a problem in the same way how we print today the, the light sources. Mm -hmm. you know? So this is something that is definitely doable. Um, well, how we will do it in the future is something that I can't talk about basically right now, but okay. I can just tell you that uh, we are doing it in a much different way than today's market is working. Uh, we we okay. make a very s simple approach how to power it in the end and uh, how to bring the content directly on top of it. You can just think about it, if you look about the vision, as streaming the content directly mm -hmm. on top of it. Yeah. Is this, applicable? Uh, is this applicable to bigger, like those advertisements on the highway? Uh, yes, it will be applicable to this big advertisements in the highway. Will it be, in theory, will it be cheap enough for it to matter? Yes, it will be. I mean, the beautiful thing about that is that 
in the end, uh, the technology will be as cheap as printing color. Yeah, because the materials themselves, they, they really don't cost that much. What um, also in, 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 the, in the displays that you have today from Samsung, all these kind of things, they have high class, high expensive materials that live a long time. Mm -hmm. But the materials that we use, they don't require this long time. And what is really driving the price is the infrastructure that you need today to produce all the Machinery, these. people that are exactly. equipped. So if you change from the super complicated infrastructure that, for example, Samsung has or the Chinese players, and where they invest 16 billion to create 40 million displays a year, mm -hmm. you know, to our infrastructure, which actually is a printer, which costs an industrial printer costs from 100K to 500K, depending how big it is, yeah? mm -hmm. it can also be much more expensive. You take out the whole CapEx thing. Yeah, you need to you know amortize the, the mm -hmm. infrastructure. It's just not happening. And the only thing that you have then is the variable costs. And while we are focusing on super low cost materials, because a lot of our thing is material based thing. Yeah, the patents are all material based. You can just get the price down significantly. Okay, I had a question. So you were saying about the battery. You were, and sorry for interrupting the the the, the, the train of thought, but you're saying that this is low low usage that also makes it the, 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 the price lower. And just out of curiosity, we're saying once again, the Autobahn, the uh, highway, big mm -hmm. publicity. Is it possible, is it rechargeable, the battery? Yes, you can can you go this. there like with a taser and it's good? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the taser would actually destroy it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you could basically recharge it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's possible. So we are now working uh, with, with uh, OLEDs that are powered by solar cells, oh, which is, which is incredible. Just, uh, working pretty well. Actually. And Germany is a very good country in terms of solar. Yes, I guess so, but, but there are already better players all around the world. Uh, in the US and in Asia. Portugal. Portugal, <laughs> yes. <laughs> who, who actually, you know. Portugal is a very good country in terms of solar, solar power. It's a very small country, but very good for that. Uh, another question, uh, as a follow-up to this um, kind of special link that you can recharge. I mean, I think the, the public or the audience might be wondering now, is it eco-friendly? Because the, the first thing I assume is it's radioactive it will give everyone cancer or everything anything like that is there any kind of concern that you faced before in terms of the eco-friendliness yes definitely i mean it would be much easier to do a radioactive uh, illuminated <laughs> page than, than the thing that we do right now yeah so uh, it's not radioactive not at all it's it's basically it's eco-friendly because all the materials that we use are basically organic compounds so mm -hmm. So we try to make sure that also the solvents that we use to print these things, they're all food grade, so that, which means is that you can use them also either for producing food or for things that are in contact with food. Yeah? And are they re reusable? So imagine that I, I have a, a magazine and I send it back to you. Can you take out the, the printing that was there, clean it up, any kind of technical part that I'm we, not... We could refurbish it, definitely. We could refurbish it, but the most important thing is that uh, when it's it's not sent back and it comes into normal trash, whether it's then hazardous to the environment, and we can say that it's not. Hmm. Interesting. Um, quick question in terms of the I know rules uh, business. How did you come up? So I mean, it was an interest of you, but how did you get into to learning more about this business? Because if this is all a fantasy, is, is there any kind of book? Anything that you've been reading more to learn more about both the ad advertising industry, but at the same time, the industry of printing? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I must really admit that I was doing some intensive desktop research on the industry to mm -hmm. find out how it works. But uh, what really helps me is the contact with the customer. So I have done a lot of plans and mm -hmm. most of these plans, they worked out. Uh, but there were also some that failed miserably. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But in the end, it, it helped me just to you know to study the market very deeply to understand what the problem is, where we could help, to whom we should go. Yeah? I mean, it's basically... and did you learn to do that during university, or like the pitching, mm -hmm. negotiating? Was it also very intuitively? I think that university here helped me a lot. Um, I think that I could also do it without it, but the university gave me the tools, basically. And the structure, probably. The structure to understand that there's a problem that needs to be structured, that needs to be analyzed, 
to see some schemes, but uh, they were just the tools. Um, what kind of tools are we talking about, if I may ask? If, for example, um, in terms of uh, which was super interesting was uh, the way how you lead teams, yeah? leadership. Mm -hmm. I, I read a book about leadership and I remember. What was the book? Um, it, 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 it was uh, Organization and uh, Leadership by Georg Schreiuk. It was one of my professors. Yeah, I, I can I can send you the please <laughs> the, the link later. Please so, do. So it's a book that he uses to to, to support actually his mm -hmm. his uh, lectures, and um, and what he does there he just summarizes the whole let's say scientific background behind you know uh, mm -hmm. management basically and, and leadership, and uh, the way how you organize a company. And I remember as I was learning it, uh, I had my struggles to, 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 to get out of this abstract concept because very theoretic, very abstract. But while I was doing the company, I realized that many problems that these people were analyzing, I realized them again by myself, like political problems, you know, political games in the company, the way how you organize a team, yeah, whether you make it bigger or smaller. And you just realize all these things that the scientists, they were analyzing it. But uh, you, as a student, you just don't understand the scope of it because you don't have the practical implications. Yeah, of course. Yeah? And while I was doing the company, I realized that all these things, they, 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 I realized that I can basically see all these things all of a sudden popping out. And there was a theory behind that and there's something that you can do, like, like culture. I remember that culture is something that is super important for startups. I mean, so many startups I meet and I speak with them about, they don't really care about culture. But culture is, I think, the most important thing if you want to keep people working for you for no money over hours yeah, and still believing in this shit that you're telling them that the company will be super big in the end, even if it fails. Yeah? And do you think that's something that you learn by doing or is it some kind, or is there any resource out there on the market that you've read mm. or any video, any documentary, or was it something that came with experience? Mm, I think that, uh, as I said, this university helped me a lot of things yeah, mm -hmm. because I could go back to this if, if, in the moment I realized the problem. But if I really go back and then think about all the advisors I have taken and all the you know uh, things I have read on the internet, mm -hmm. if they are written out of a practical view and you are not there yet, you don't understand them. You need to read the right things at the right time to understand what you are doing so that it can help you. Mm -hmm. yeah? So the, we, we have been now reading this, this one book about financing. How do you finance? How do you structure your financing approach? Mm -hmm. So while I was in financing, I totally understood the problems. If I would read it two years before, probably you wouldn't be able to. Not at all. I would not be able to follow the book. The only thing that I would be able to do is to go back to the book in the moment I have the problem. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to find some good books. But in the end, you have to get in and be with your customers, be with your employees, understand what their problem is. And if you realize you cannot understand the problem, try to find a solution somewhere. Yeah? Google it, speak with people. What really helped me the most was speaking with other entrepreneurs. Speaking with other entrepreneurs and listening to how these people failed, how, what problems they had, what struggles they had. Interesting. Yeah, all the other stories about uh, how good we were, how much we sold, how we opened up these this businesses, it's bullshit. If a business is running well, everybody can do it. Yeah? Have, you, have you ever heard of this? There's this, um, a couple of websites actually that's called Postmortem and something like that. That's like a, a list of startups that died and there's like a documentary styled approach to how each company died. Really? Yeah, I'll send it to you and I'll yeah, link it up in the show notes. This sounds amazing, yeah. Yeah, uh, I remember I was talking with someone back in Portugal about that. I'll, I'll look it up and I'll send it to you. Might be an interesting thing for you to read. Yes, sure. Thank so you. are you ready to jump up to some rapid fire questions? Yes. So rapid fire question is very simple. I'll ask you something and then you have to answer it in one minute. Okay. We have a deal? Yes, let's do it. Okay, what's your favorite tool slash the one tool that you would not be able to live without? My notebook. Your notebook. Is it a physical notebook? It's a physical notebook with, with pen and paper. I could not live without that. Okay. Uh, tell me something you changed your mind in the last six months. It's not necessarily a question, but... Did I, when I changed my mind in the last six months... Something that changed my mind or whether I changed my mind? You changed your mind about in the last six uh, months. About our business model. 
Really? Yes, of course. Did it change a lot within the last six months? <laughs> I think, yes, we changed the approach how we sell it. Yes, we, uh, we had before, we have just been uh, pushing it uh, all towards the packaging manufacturers. Mm -hmm. What we do right now is a push-pull thing. So we basically go to the brands to understand more what the brands need mm -hmm. and speak more with their consumers to understand what kind of product we need to develop, deliver them. And in this way, we make sure that we understand how much they are willing to pay. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing, of course, is we, we help uh, our customers, that are the packaging manufacturers, to sell in the same thing because they have a ready-to-sell product that everybody wants. And what, what, got to, what made you change that? Was it... Um Was it the, the, your own experience that made you change your mind? Was it a, an advice? Was it something that you heard? What happened? It was actually an analysis of uh, the recent year. Yeah? So I was taking a look at how the year went, uh, mm -hmm. where we could be, uh, what kind of opportunities we lost and what went wrong. And I understand to make it better, we have to you know, change this whole thing. Okay, one last question, because I think throughout the, the whole interview, you touched on some of my questions, which is good. Um, <laughs> if you were starting today, From scratch, where would you focus on? Assuming that you've had different businesses in different areas. I mean, it depends what I would, how much money I would have, right? <laughs> If somebody would give me money to build okay, a time, time machine. <laughs> let's assume you were finishing college and you had 500 euros. Okay, and I have 500 euros. Then I would try to, to focus on the customer. As, as much as possible to understand. But to do what? To do, I, I, I can, I can think um, for myself something out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I would start today again, so you had nothing. I have nothing. Oh my god! Yeah, 500 euros. <laughs> That's mean. That's a mean question. <laughs> <laughs> if I had 500 euros, uh, I would actually start to write books. I guess. Really? <laughs> yes. Maybe I would do this in the beginning, but no. If I would be a student, my experience would be way too low. No, no. Let's assume you have all your own, all your own knowledge. Mm -hmm. Everything is like as is, but you are starting today. Let's assume you were moved today to another city with no network and a 500 euros. I think you have your knowledge. I, with my knowledge, I think I would start to do the same that I'm doing today right now. So in a row, but in, row. in that city. Exactly. Okay. So as in a more simple sense, you would start working on something in the ad tech area. I would start to work uh, with something that uh, has a potential to change the world how our technology has right now because i mean one thing that we didn't cover this in the end is if you have a display on any package in the world mm. yeah you can stream the content directly on top of mm -hmm. on, on the packaging so you don't have to print it anymore you can stream it which means you don't have to print 30 different kind of labels for europe so you save a lot of logistics cost Uh, slash, you just need the paper because the, the streaming will exactly. take care of itself. Out. So carbon footprint much lower, less packaging waste, less printing inks to be quiet. Uh, so for us, th this is this is what what is what is really making me hard. So if I would start again doing a company and I had the same mindset I have right now, I would start to do it again from scratch exactly with the same thing. Uh, I would try to get the product out on the market as quick as possible and think what I could do with that. Uh, Maybe I could also start to build rockets, but I think with 500 euros, it would be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, 500 euros, it's not that many, much money. Yeah, but You're persuasive. Yeah. You're persuasive. Don't worry about that. Don't cut yourself short. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, to finish it off, uh, what's the best advice you've ever gotten? The best advice would I've ever got, don't push the river, it will flow by itself. Can you repeat that? Don't push the river, it will flow by itself. There's, there's something in life, and this is now getting mystic. Uh, this, is, this is something that's truly in my belief how nature works. I believe that uh, there are some things in life you can push, 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 and they will never come, they will never happen, mm -hmm. unless you just totally drop them. And the moment you drop them, they will arrive. Uh, like when you were young and you tried to get the girls, and the moment you try to get the girls, you never get them. You only get them if you're not interested at all. Uh, and, and I realize it with deals, I, re I realize it with many things, Sometimes it's really just good to let go. No matter how hard you try to push, you just can't do more than you can do. You know? So I think to really let go is something that, that saved me from you know, getting a stroke and a heart attack in the last years pretty often. You know? Great, great advice. And I've never heard that. And it's actually like, um, what's, it, uh, what's it called? The, the, the laws... 
Newton law? No, not Newton law. Murphy law. Murphy. It's kind of a, a sick Murphy law. So from the moment you don't care anymore, it happens. Interesting. Okay, if people in the audience want to get in touch with you or know more about you, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me on the internet, on LinkedIn, basically. And of course, they can directly drop me an email. I think our email is on the webpage, so please. So the webpage, it's inuru.de. Exactly. And your social media, your LinkedIn will be on the show notes. Thank you so much, Martin. This was a great talk. I learned a lot and I hope everybody at home learns a lot as well. Thank you so much for coming here. You're one and a half hours commuting time. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. It was hard. It was Thank so you so much, man. Thank you. Have a great day. Likewise. Thank you so much for plugging into this conversation. Please go and check their website, inuru.de, and Google them. You'll be able to see their products. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's real life magic. And their vision is quite bigger. I don't know about you, but coming from, let's call it industry, advertising industry and marketing industry, I really find this invention a pioneering technology. Congratulations to Martin and his team on what they're building. Any information that you might have missed, we will probably be linked up in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, consider subscribing to make sure that this podcast grows and we can get more people and help everybody be the pioneers of their own lives and careers. Another thing, please leave another thing, please leave a rating and a review on iTunes on whatever it is the platform that you're listening to it. Right now, the Pioneer Show, it's also on Spotify. If you enjoyed the conversation, please let me know. 